separate that ahead of time is a little bit of a hazard for implementation in a lot of parallel cases. For running on a single system, if you know you're going to just plow through it all there, uh, it, it's got a lot of benefits. It just hurts a little more in a cluster. Uh, hi. So you uh, talked a lot about the geometry and the ray tracing, all that sort of stuff. I was just curious if you could talk about how you manage the light representations, specifically things yeah. like fluorescence okay. and that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I, and yet another one of my topics that was on my list that I didn't have time to go through. <clears throat> um, so again, the the classical computer graphics light is you wind up with. Three, mo three models of light. You've got a point light, a spotlight, and a parallel light. And those are our sort of baseline lights in the editor. The, uh, we, we augment the point lights by giving them an area radius so we can get the soft shadows and so we can add the distributed ray tracing to that. The, the biggest problem, though, is that these are, all of our lights are completely physically implausible because they're physically bounded, with the exception of the parallel light. And some of this is history when we go from, from Quake 1 uh, you know, all the way up through, especially Doom 3, we built all of our lights out of, uh, out of textures because Doom 3 was all dynamic. So we multiplied two textures together where you would have a, a projection texture and a fall-off texture. So they occupied this, uh, you know, this physical space in, uh, in the world, which is great for, for culling reasons where you can say, all right, in Doom 3, we tried to say no more than three lights hitting a surface because it was a linear cost. Every light cost more on that surface. So we wound up with these lights that were, were very physically implausible. While you can make, if you're doing this multiplying two textures together, you can make a Gaussian fall-off light, which is a pleasant light to work with that is radially symmetric, but most of the lights in the game wound up being our square light, which is a, a light that goes almost to the outside edges of this, uh, this texture, just fading a little bit and then fading a little bit in the other direction so we could get kind of about as much light as we could into the world for a minimal fragment cost. And unfortunately, we kept those through rage as most of our... Uh, you know, as our primary light style. And we had some of our very best artists love this because it gave them total control. They, they would call it painting with light. So they would be able to say, I want this area a little bit brighter here. So, you know, I'll, move, I'll use this different texture instead of this standard one. I'll move this or I'll stretch it so it just barely goes below the floor, but it has no fall off. So it's going to throw all the light into it. And that is largely the, the type of artistic wizardry that we need to evolve past because you will never be able to take light emitters like that and make the world feel real because the light's not real. You can even have completely real materials and you could be doing it with path tracing, but if your light is only coming from these things that do not resemble real lights, then it's never going to be bought off as real. Now, several years ago, I made uh, a, pre a premature, evidently, push towards uh, physically-based lighting where I was trying to set all of our lights up with uh, using IES light profiles, which are these actual light profiles that the people that make light bulbs go and measure all of these things. You can get uh, you know, the light that's coming at all of these different uh, areas, different sample points coming out of it. And that's really useful, although it's important to note that there are simplifications in here. Just, like, just because you see an equation doesn't mean it's true. Just because you see a table of data doesn't mean it's true either. Because you have simplifications like an IES spec for three fluorescent bulbs in, uh, in a fixture. And yes, you are sampling what the light is at all of these points, but really you should be getting three shadows from it rather than, you know, rather than one from an area like source. So there's simplifications built into that. But I still, you know, we are not currently using that. Uh, the main reason why it, it fell through when I pushed for it originally was it comes back to the performance. Uh, to keep the build times at a certain, you know, at a level that they were familiar with, you wound up with these lights now are extending infinitely. They're proper inverse square fall off lights. So if you've got a a level with a thousand lights in it, then in theory you're tracing a thousand traces out at a minimum to just see whether any light gets there. So you, you cut this down to some rational number of samples and what that means is there's lots of noise in the images. And one of the battles that's been particularly hard for all of the Tech 5 stuff is trying to have a situation where the designers and artists are, are willing to work with an approximation of what they, uh, you know, what the final output is. And it is, you know, it is just very tempting to say, well, I always want to look at what the final output is, which means that everything is always a production quality render, which means it always takes forever. 
And as, you know, I, I keep hoping that there will be more of an acceptance of, well, this is roughly what it's like. I can still you know, figure out what my gameplay and rough lighting and everything is, but that's a battle that we fight daily on this. Hi, John. Uh, taking quality materials data for granted, I'm curious what additional visual fidelity you gain by uh, ray tracing voxel lock trees, and then what visual sacrifices you make, and what sacrifices you have to make in terms of performance, or to gain performance. So the, the question of what you're ray tracing against is sort of orthogonal to the, the method. I mean, while you can, uh, you can rasterize or ray trace lots of different representations, and there was lots of work that went into directly ray tracing against curved surfaces and certainly spheres in some of the easy cases. And for years, I did think that ray tracing into some form of voxel space would be a, uh, an obvious thing to do because it seems that there's you know, there's winds, there's, it's certainly far simpler. You can make a more regular data structure, there's, there's all these things, but it doesn't seem to be panning out that way. It does seem to be that all ray tracing will be against triangle meshes that you will decimate to it. And there's certainly advantages to the, the comfortable tool paths, everything there. And it seems that's the way that history is flowing, and that's probably the way it's going to work out when we are ray tracing everything. You talked a little bit yesterday on the motion blur that happens on like a, um, the LCD screens mm -hmm. as you're moving your head very quickly. Uh, do you have any more thoughts on if that's a solvable problem for this generation of VR or is that going to take a little longer? So we have an existence proof of something that's good enough. I mean, what Valve put together by packing up the, uh, the Samsung displays is, uh, is good enough. If we can get 90 hertz displays that are low persistence, uh, that will do. Uh, you know, 120 would probably be better, but uh, and like my interlay scheme may be a good thing to uh, to kind of add on top of that if it can be done. Uh, but I think there's there's a good prospect. You know, the fallback plan is uh, LCD backlight flashing. So it's important, and I think that I, I'm betting that it will be solved for sort of consumer grade VR in the, the not too distant future, but it's, uh, you know, it's not there right now outside of Valve's prototype. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Hi, John. Yep. Thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, I read an MIT paper explaining how to compute saw shadows, and what they did was uh, they interpolated linearly between uh, the parts that were lit and the parts that were not mm -hmm. lit. Uh, is that the approach it takes? Is that a linear map or a nonlinear map between the umbra and the penumbra? And I was just hoping you could explain in detail how you calculate the intermediate levels. No, okay, so that does fall into the, uh, the category of large body of work of approximations that is pretty much gone and forgotten right now. Our soft shadows are done by sending a certain number of samples, like it's 16 by default. So you send 16 samples to different points on the light that are randomly distributed and the density of the shadow is just the fraction of them that get through. So you can crank that number up in some cases for some of the, the really broad area emitters. In theory, you'd want it to be 256 samples so you could get a full range of, you know, or even more on a very bright lights. But we, we get by with 16. There's, there's an approximation that I did on that that circum instead of randomly sending to all points in the center of the, all points across the area of the light source, by default, we send them across the circumference of the light, which gives you, you know, in theory, can sometimes make it look uh, a square factor better, but it looks bad at edges. So we're still tracing different things on there. But in the bottom line, it's just however many samples you throw. That's the fraction that comes out. Things like that are going back through the history of graphics for 40 years. There's a ton of things that were somewhat complicated analytic solutions that have just over and over fallen to raw brute force. And I think that all of these things will as well. You know, when we, when we are tracing billions of rays per frame, uh, that's when we'll be using ray tracing. I don't think there's going to be too many intermediate steps to that. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I know that in AutoCAD and other engineering programs of such sorts, uh, there are catalogs of different types of materials that you can uh, test the uh, effects of different uh, different things on the um, structure, or so on and so forth, of just the different kinds of materials. And what my question is for you is that with trying to make your artist use more accurate materials, are you trying to like create a catalog of textures or yeah, so right now we are very much trying to have our, our master swatch list of, uh, you know, if, 
we need, there's the clear things about, okay, if you're metal, you're in this range. If you're paint, you're in this range. If you're wood, you're in this range, asphalt. And having all of this represented as these are the, the valid ranges of diffuse specular roughness um, and maps that you're going to have. Uh, so we're, we're still working through all of that. And in terms of material libraries, it's, it's a little frustrating when you look at whether it's you know, 3D Studio or Modo or uh, V-Ray, whatever. Uh, the materialists are usually the ad hoc collection that's accreted over a couple decades of company lifespan, and they're usually not a complete, consistent, cohesive, physically-based set of materials. We spend a little bit of time trying to, uh, to backtrack values from one of the, the material library sets into the things that we could use, and it wasn't completely clear that they were, that they were coming out in the right ranges, so we're, you know, we're building up our own set, and there's lots of studios doing that. There are... Uh, online, there are sets of BRDF measurements for a lot of materials that would be good to start uh, drawing some of the materials from, but there's, we're still looking for, okay, what's the diffuse specular and roughness uh, values going rather than this full table of data, but eventually, I expect that we all will be using, this is data scanned in from the real world, because over and over, that's what eventually wins in the end. Okay. Thank you. All right. That looks like it. John, thank right. you. Thanks. On time. <laughs>